Amen. Jesus is alive. That's what today is about, isn't it? Jesus is alive. We don't serve a dead Savior. We serve one who is alive today. Well, today, as uh, for those who are, are, happen to be watching on uh, the Hospital Network, and I'm Chaplain Anthony Kelly, but today is my last day as the chapel pastor. I'm turning over the reins to Chaplain Belcher, sitting over there. And uh, so he's going to be the new uh, overseer and uh, manager uh, of the chapels here uh, at the hospital. So um, if you do have a question, he's going to be the go-to guy now. So, but I'm going to be heading on in just uh, uh, next month uh, to uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And so get preparing for that uh, move uh, where God has uh, opened the doors for me to go to get, uh, it's an ACS program, Advanced Civil Schooling, and I'll be able to go get a uh, marriage and family life therapy degree uh, at Fort Bragg uh, through Webster University. So it's a great opportunity. I'm excited. Uh, so, but not so excited to have to go back to school again. I know my wife's not so excited, but I'm going to have to hit the books again. But hey, that's been, it seems like my whole adult career in the ministry is just constant education. But you can never get too much education, right? Amen. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Revelation chapter uh, 1. And uh, as we open up, I just want to ask a couple questions. What does it really mean for someone to come back from the dead? What does that mean? What does it mean to truly be for somebody who's dead to come back alive? Is it even possible? Is it that somebody's clinically dead and they can come back to life? I know that in history, many people have pondered that idea, and I know that many of, there's ghost stories and things like that, but it's not the same, but, but they've pondered, what, is there an afterlife? Is there an eternal life truly out there? Is the Bible true in what it says? And, and there's many, and even in literature, William Shakespeare pondered that idea in Hamlet, his play Hamlet, where Hamlet is at school in Germany, and he comes back to his home in Denmark, and he finds out that his mother had married his uncle. His father had passed away. His father, the king, had passed away. And so his mother then in turn married her brother-in-law. Uh, and that is the brother of king. And so as Hamlet's pondering that foul incest, to quote uh, Shakespeare, his father's ghost comes to him and says, hey, my brother killed me and took my throne. So the rest of the play is him trying to ponder what to do. Should he take revenge upon his own uncle for stealing the throne, killing his father, and then marrying his mother? What should he do about the whole thing? And tragically, at the end, all the main characters die off in the play, and so does Hamlet. What does it truly mean to come back from the dead? In the Old Testament, we have the story of, in 1 Samuel 28, the story of King Saul. As he is going to war with David, David took up with the Philistines, and they're going to go to Israel, and, and, and the Philistines are going to go to war against one another. In desperation, King Saul goes to the witch of Endor, which was forbidden. He goes to the witch of Endor, and he asks, conjure up Samuel the prophet, who had been dead several years. Conjure him up. I need to know what God wants me to do. So she conjures up Samuel's ghost and he gives a pronouncement of judgment that Saul did not want to hear. So he goes in the battle the next day and he knows that he is losing as he's losing the battle against the Philistines, against David. He then takes his own life, tragically falls on his own sword. What does it truly mean to come back from the dead? Mark records the account in Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 51, of Jesus walking on the water. But get the scene. Before that time, Jesus is on the mountainside praying. And he tells the disciples, go across this five-mile wide sea of Galilee. Go to the other side, and I'll be with you shortly. The disciples thought Jesus was going to take a boat. They even left one for him to take. So as they're crossing this lake, they encounter a fierce storm. These hardened 
fishermen who were experts at fishing those waters had probably had their share of tales, didn't they? They probably had their giant squid or fish stories or their Moby Dick type stories, their stories of mermaids, who knows what the type of stories they had. Probably of old sailors uh, dying out on the sea and their, their ghosts you know, traveling at night. But whatever it was that they thought, they encountered this storm and the Greek word for the storm that they encountered said it was buffeting them. Literally, it's almost like a demonic torment. And they were fearful and they were afraid of sinking and drowning. These hardened expert fishermen then see something walking on the water. And perhaps the, those fishing stories, those tales, those myths start popping up in their mind. And they immediately start shouting, it is a ghost. Or in other words, a disembodied spirit walking on the water to us. And they started getting even more terrified. But then they encounter Jesus walking in the water saying, take courage, it is I. Amen. Literally, he's saying, it is I am in the Greek. What does it truly mean to come back from the dead? What does it truly mean? What does that mean? Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of Sherlock Holmes and his wife belonged to the Spiritist Church. That, that was a church back then, back in the turn of the century that was involved in seances. And they believed that the, part of their religious faith is they had to contact the dead through seances and trances and automatic handwriting. By the way, all the things that we as Christians are forbidden to do. They were friends with a man named famous magician, escape artist, extraordinaire Harry Houdini. Now, Harry Houdini was a Jewish, Jewish guy. His real name was Eric Weiss. He was an immigrant from Hungary. His parents were uh, Hungarian, Jewish Hungarian immigrants who never spoke English in their life, but he did. He befriended Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and his wife. And they were convinced, though, that he did his escapes by spiritual means, that that, that was supernatural, and that he was able to tap into uh, the, the spiritual and transform himself out of crates that were sunk in the water while he was all chained up inside. That it wasn't trickery or picking locks, but it was, he was able to somehow spiritually transform out of those things. And so that was, that was their thought. And then once Harry Houdini's mother had passed away, he was a mama's boy, he was very close to the mother. And once she had passed away, he was kind of interested then in the afterlife. Is it possible for somebody to contact the dead? Is it possible that there is an afterlife? There's something more than this worldly fleshly existence. So what did Harry Houdini do? He, he allowed himself to go to a seance with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and his wife, and his wife was leading the seance. And, and so supposedly, she contacted Harry Houdini's dead mother in the seance and started speaking some things to him. But Harry Houdini knew that it wasn't his mother because his mother had never spoke English in her life. She was Hungarian. So she never ever spoke any English at all. So he knew immediately right away, this is not my mother. They're self-deluded. This couple is wrong. And in fact, he broke and severed his relationship with them, the friendship, and immediately did a disposition in court saying that they were wrong. They were deluded. They, he never once spoke to his dead mother. And that happened in 1922. Is it possible to come back from the dead? Another experience, experience I had personally is when I was a student, a CPE student resident at Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, or BMC, and I was doing, as I was training to be a hospital chaplain, I had the privilege of doing overnight duty and I was called to the trauma unit and this lady was being carted in and they were, she was coding and they, they were literally on top of her, pumping, giving her chest compressions on her chest as they're wheeling her into the trauma bay. And she had already been dead and they were trying to bring her back to life. And then they were taking turns for at least about a half hour, constantly. And then nothing could, nothing could save her. Finally, the doctor called it, pronounced the time. As the chaplain on call, it was my duty to go with the doctor to the family. There was a daughter 
of this woman, and she was in the waiting room to give her the news that her mother had passed away. The daughter was a Pentecostal Christian who crying and praying. She started praying in tongues and she's crying and weeping. And eventually she wanted to go see her mom's body. So I, we wait for a while and I stayed with her the entire time. And then we, I walked her back to take her to see her mom's body. By then, all the, all the doctors and nurses, everybody was out of the room except one lone technician, technician who was cleaning up some stuff. And she again, so immediately started crying and, and, and just weeping over her mother. And, and she just was praying, started praying in tongues and being a Pentecostal. And she laid her hand on her mom and she felt a pulse. She said, I feel a pulse. Technician said, no, no, ma'am. You, what you feel is the gases from the decompression, the compressions on her chest that we had, the gases are escaping. She says, no, there's a rhythm to it. It feels like a pulse. So the technician goes, feels, he finds a pulse. He goes, uh-oh, exact literal words, uh-oh. And he runs out of the room. And then just about every single person on duty and down in the ER came and then that little trauma bay and they just flooded that trauma bay. And that woman was alive after being pronounced dead and she was dead for well over an hour. Can people come back from the dead? That was an extraordinary circumstance. I even asked the doctor, does this ever happen? He says, no, it's never happened to me. It's not supposed to ever happen. Now she held on for three days until all her family could be there. And then she passed away. And I firmly believe that God brought her back so that she could be with her family. Her family could say their goodbyes to her Amen. before she passed. What does it truly mean to be dead, clinically, physically dead in the body, yet come back to life again? What does that truly mean? In fact, in the scripture, it tells us in our passage today, Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 7. John, to the seven churches of the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from whom who is, who was, who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over all the kings of the earth, to him who loves us, <coughs> excuse me, and has freed us. From our sins by his blood and has made us to be kingdom and priests to serve as God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he's coming in the clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. What does it truly mean when the passage tells us that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Now this passage tells us a lot of things. First of all, it tells us that Jesus still loves us. Amen. That Jesus loves us, present tense, plural, participle, Jesus loves us. That means it's an ongoing, continual love that is not in the past, not past tense, not Jesus loved us, but Jesus loves us. But it also says, from him who's the firstborn of the dead. That's an interesting phrase. What does it truly mean? Firstborn from the dead. What implications does that have for us? In Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul writes this about Jesus. And he is the head of the body, the church. And he's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. The Gnostics. These were people, uh, a, a group, kind of like a cultish group. And one of the things that they believed in in the first century, and one of the things they believed in was the fact that Jesus really did not come back, phys did not come physically on earth. He being God's son, God cannot cohabitate with a sinful man. So there Jesus was just an aberration. He was a phantom or a ghost, if you will. That Jesus really in the flesh never came, so he never really died in the flesh on the cross. It was an appearance of that, and therefore Jesus never came. But John wrote that Jesus is the Word become flesh Amen. to denounce Gnostic theology. That Gnostic teaching that held to the secret knowledge that only they had the truth. But John was saying, no. 
Jesus is the word become flesh. And in John's revelation here, he says that Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead. Yes, we know that Jesus literally came up on this earth and died, right? Jesus literally was born in a manger, born to Mary, laid in a manger, lived a life. And at age, what, 30, he ended up teaching, gathering disciples, teaching and preaching, lived on earth. And died at age 33. We know that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection are physical events proven in Scripture. And that Jesus' incarnation upon this earth came to destroy the works, all the works of the devil. Acts 10, 38. That Jesus came to destroy all the works of the devil. And that by Jesus going to the cross, it bridges that gap. Once that we, because of our sinful nature, were alienated from God. But Jesus, thanks be to Jesus coming and going to the cross, has bridged that gap. And now we have communion. We have unity with God through Jesus. That, that, that barrier of hostility has been broken once and for all. And that Jesus is the author of life, the scripture says. And that's why on Easter, we can sing hymns about Jesus resurrecting. Up from the grave, he arose of the triumph, mighty power over his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with the saints to reign. Amen. That he arose, he arose, hallelujah, Jesus Christ arose. The word resurrection appears 43 times, mainly in the New Testament. There is a doctrine by the Pharisees. <clears throat> These were the one of the sects of Judaism. And the Pharisees were the more uh, pharisaical, a bunch, I mean. But they were more the conservative of the bunch. And they believed in a life after that there is a resurrection. That not only is there eternal life, but then that the, our spirits somehow are resurrected. There is a resurrection from the dead. Now, traditionally, Jews believe that your spirit remains with the body three days. And then is resurrected to go to eternity with God the Father. But the Old Testament, it tells us when someone died such as a good king, it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 31, that he rested with their fathers. There, that term of resurrect, resurrection, that, that, that word of resurrection is not really found much in the Old Testament. Now, we do see people coming back to life in the Old Testament. There's a couple, few cases. There's one when Elijah prayed over a dead life of a dead young man, and he came back to life in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 23. The prophet Elisha prayed for the Shunammite's son, and he came to life in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 4, 35 and following. And also there's a story of when dead, a, man, a dead body of a man touched the bones of Elisha, and he came to life in 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 21. But we realize in the New Testament that resurrection power first is held by Jesus Christ. That God raised him from the dead. And Jesus is the author of life. And as John phrases it, in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. <clears throat> Do you realize that no one has ever died in the presence of Jesus? No one. I, I dare you to check the record. No one has ever died in the presence of Jesus. When Jesus came near dead people, they came to life. Ask the 12-year-old daughter of Jairus who came to life when Jesus told her to. Ask Lazarus. After four days, he was resurrected back to life. In fact, it's even conceivable that Lazarus' soul, spirit, was already in paradise and somehow brought back from paradise to go back into his body. Jesus is life. Jesus is the author of life. And whenever people came near Jesus, Jesus ruins a perfectly good funeral every time, doesn't he? Perfectly good funeral. You got everything going for the wake and all that, and then Jesus comes along and people come to life. With Jesus, that spiritual divide is broken. The graves of many holy people came to life when Jesus died. Matthew 27, verse 52. And in fact, it even says that after the resurrection, Jesus went to go talk to over 500 believers. Jesus said himself, he is the resurrection and the what life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever believes in me will never die. Amen. Jesus is the firstborn 
from among the dead. Jesus is alive. It's not the walking dead. It's the walking alive. Jesus is alive. And we ask, where's Jesus now? Jesus is alive and he's at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is alive. He's not dead in heaven. He is alive. That way, when he comes back for the second coming, he's going to come back and every eye is going to see him, even those who's pierced him. That, that, that second coming is going to cross even all those spiritual barriers that there is, and even those who are dead will see him. But Jesus is alive. And Jesus has promised an eternal life for you and I. And you and I are promised a resurrection one day. A resurrection to resurrect out of our graves to be with the Lord. The Bible tells us to be absent from the body is what? To be present with the Lord. There is that promise of eternal hope, of a resurrection and eternal life for those who follow Jesus Christ, who make Jesus Christ their personal Lord and Savior. There is that. Not all the world religions out there can promise that, but Christianity can. You go to, I said it earlier, but you go to any tomb of any great man in history or woman in history, any great person in history, you'll find the word occupied. Their bones are in there. They are in there. You go to the tomb of Jesus Christ, it is empty. Why? It is vacant. Jesus did not need that barred tomb of Joseph of Arimathea for very long. Jesus resurrected. He is alive. And that, that too, we can have joy and we can have hope and we can have faith in the fact that we serve a risen Savior and He's in the world today. Jesus is alive. There's life in the name of Jesus. There's hope in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's resurrection in the name of Jesus. There's faith in the name of Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. There's eternity in the name of Jesus. There's freedom in the name of Jesus. There's chains are broken in the name of Jesus. Demons flee in the name of Jesus. Graves burst open in the name of Jesus. The dead will live in the name of Jesus. Your soul is saved in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Jesus is the author of life. Amen. Jesus is life. Amen. Right. Don't have any doubts any longer, brethren. Don't be fearful in life any longer. Mm -hmm. Don't give way to depression and worry and anxiety any longer. Cast all those things upon Jesus. He cares for us. He wants to take care of our lives. He wants to take care of your minds, your body, your soul, your spirit, your mind, will, and emotions. He wants to take care of you. Give it all to him. Amen. Lay it down at his feet yes. and say, Jesus, come in my life. Amen. I give you my life as you give me mine. Amen. Jesus is life. I also want to say something too. There are some where you need to become a martyr out there in this world in order to, to gain eternal life of some sort. Jesus never once wanted his disciples to become martyrs. Yes, some do. But the simple fact is Jesus said, I've come to give you life and that abundantly. Amen. Jesus is the giver of life. He's the author of life. Jesus is life. Amen. The capital L, life. So I encourage each and every one of you, for those watching a hospital network, for those of us here, those of us on social media, wherever it is you are at, within your walk or faith with the Lord, just give your life fully over to Him. He gave it fully for you. He suffered and died at the hands of sinful men so that we can become or have eternal life and we can get saved. Jesus offers it to us just by faith. And I personally believe by faith, repentance, confession, water baptism, those things lead us to Jesus. They're steps in the walk of salvation. As my last sermon to you all today, it is my prayer, each and every one of us, have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, our personal Lord and Savior, to come to know him in a real, powerful, tangible way. Jesus is life. And he will give you life. And he will give you hope. And he will give you that light again in your life that's been stuffed, snuffed out of dark, by darkness.
It seems like we've been living in turbulent times lately, haven't we? COVID times. Times of stress. But give it to Jesus. He will give us a yoke that is easy and light. And I'm not talking about his type of eggs that he eats. Burn easy, yoke is light. But Jesus is life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you touch each and every one of us here today. Fill us full of your spirit. Lord, may we see you, feel you, sense you, and experience you in new and fresh and powerful ways that we will never, ever be the same again. And Lord, it is my earnest prayer that everybody in this hospital, everybody watching, Lord, will come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. And that, Lord Jesus, that we will seek you with all of our heart, all of our mind, our body, soul, and spirit, mind, and strength. And Lord, I pray that you touch. And Lord, I pray that you heal. And I pray that you set the captives free. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And we praise your most holy name. For this is the day that the Lord has made. And we are going to rejoice and be glad in it. For you have risen and risen indeed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. The Lord is risen. Everybody with me. He has risen indeed. Our Lord has risen. He is risen indeed. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Death has been swallowed up in victory. Christ the Lord has risen indeed. Amen. And it's my prayer that God goes with you this day. And may God's grace and mercy follow you all the days of your long lives. That the Lord will shine his face upon you and be gracious. In Jesus' name, amen.